This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Happy Twitterversary! <laughs> Way! I didn't get your approval to post that. I just thought it was very funny that you get a message from Twitter when you've been on Twitter With for a year. With a little number one. <laughs> little number one image, at Serious Danger AU. Follow it. We've been stuck on 2,941 followers, it seems, for a very long time, and I would like that Have to we? change if people... How do just, you know? I, You're clearly watching so closely. <laughs> just, that just feels like a familiar number. So if you haven't yet, please follow us on Twitter before Twitter itself explodes <laughs> and ends and no one's on it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know. Like asking someone to follow you on Twitter at the moment does feel a little bit like, hey, jump on the, I know the ship's, oh, don't worry about it. It's sinking a little bit, but jump on. Come on. Like... <laughs> I mean, we're blue checks. I'm a blue check myself. You're a blue check. Mm. Our Serious mm-hmm. Danger AU uh, account is a blue check. Mm. Are we going to invest? So it's been hard. It's been a hard week, yeah. It's been really tough, yeah. It does feel like, yeah, everything that I've worked so hard for <laughs> like, is about to be taken away from me. Um, how did you get your blue check? I have no idea. I woke up one you have day no and it idea? was there. The no. mo- You know what's embarrassing? Like I asked. I, I asked for mine. You Oh, you hit up the people. Oh, my yeah. gosh. I know that's yeah, that's really <laughs> actually crazy story. Years ago, I got a DM from Olivia Coleman's management asking because I followed her on Twitter, asking me how I got my blue check and how Olivia wow. could go about getting her account verified. That wow. is a true fucking story. Yeah, no, I it's it's true. Like it's kind of I I feel at the moment because you know the verifications process has been pretty fucked for however many years, and you just. I guess this is typical of it, right? You kind of have to know someone. You have to go through someone who knows how to do it, who knows someone who knows the processes. Right. I think like, yeah, I regret it. I kind of wish I didn't have a blue check. <laughs> I do regret it. I feel like at the time I was dating a blue check and I just wanted to, to fit in. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted him to like it me. It does feel like in terms of like, you know, figuring out who our class enemies are and who's going to survive the revolution. It really, like you would start with all blue checks immediately and then yeah. you don't get rid of that. Yeah. So no, I'll eagerly, I think if I can lose my blue check and um, just move on from that phase of, in my life. <laughs> Become a working class tweeter. You'll be fine. Just incredible. Did you see the story about how the use of the N-word increased by 500% following yeah. the Elon Musk takeover? What the fuck is that? And, like, he's just, he's just like, tweeting at, in the middle of, like, he's just posting at, like, 2 a.m., just, like, the weirdest shit. Did Grimes, is he back with Grimes? Did Grimes, because Grimes left him and then she with, was with Chelsea Manning. But it seems so much like. What, Grimes dated Chelsea Manning? Yes, you missed this? I missed oh that. My That's God. insane. Yes. That's they incredible. They were or are dating. Like, <laughs> yeah, fucking so wild. Grimes, what a what an enigmatic, like <laughs> absolutely my problematic fave. Yes. Um, yeah, and now now they're saying he's like investigating basically like a an OnlyFans type thing, or he's looking at some sort of like possibility for paid content and they're like probably potentially adult content so he's also turning twitter into like well i guess twitter's already kind of a porn website but paid yes. porn but is it like subscribing like people would have to pay a certain fee to access like my tweets is that the idea mm-hmm. and i'm charging for uh, tweets i don't know i don't know if it's like that i don't know <laughs> i don't know well just i just just keep posting you know just keep posting until we fall off the posting cliff it's all we can do tom and shout out to the people who are struggling. I don't know if you saw this. This is some guy, Mike Goldsworthy, who is a blue check, so he knows what he's talking about. And he tweeted, yes, $8 a month or $96 per year for a blue circle on a social media profile is a luxury many simply cannot afford. Maybe you're all well off in Denmark, but here in the UK, there's shocking inequality and young kids are going hungry. Their parents can't get blue ticks, but rich kids can. The parents can't get blue ticks, but rich kids can. Yes. What? I guess the, the working class masses, all of them struggling in the cost of living crisis, can't afford the blue check. But, you know, but Jacob Rees Mogg's kids. It's also like a reverse generational thing where, oh, like the kids are rich. This is a bit, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really But that's tough. coming from a blue check a- account. So, you know, it's a good tweet. Yeah. No. Well, look, Tom, I believe in universalism. Mm-hmm. I think that blue checks should be free and available to anyone who wants one. 
I disagree so strongly. I think it should be highly means tested and there should be a really <laughs> long verification process and therefore only the best, only the lifters. Targeted, targeted. <laughs> targeted support. Label we coming out with this policy. <laughs> Idiots. People sometimes assume that I am supporting green parties and so on, which is of course not true. If you want the dole for life, free marijuana, vote Greens. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. <laughs> serious danger to Australia. Anyway, follow us on Twitter at Serious Danger AU. That's the show that you're listening to now. This is a podcast about Greens politics in Australia. Thank you for listening. This is not an official Greens Party podcast. It is made possible with the help of the Green Institute and Michael the Griff Griffin. I'm Tom Ballard. That there is I'm Emerald Moon. Moon. There she is. I beat you. Yeah, it's me. Let me say my own name, Tom. You think I can't say my own name? Never. What are we talking about on the show this week, Emerald? Uh, this week we are looking at gambling, the proposed changes to gambling ad rules and a bunch of other stuff about how gambling corporations are shit and evil and own our democracy. And you spoke to comedian Dave Anthony from The Dollop about American politics being fucked and the US midterm elections coming up. I'm really bummed that I missed that conversation. Yes, I'm sorry you couldn't join us, but he sort of he has very limited time. He's on tour at the moment across the US. Life of a blue check. Yes, well, it did. I, I asked see. him the big blue check question, so you'll hear his answer on that front, which is what everyone's talking about. And he'll also depress you about the, the state of the American political landscape and how we're all truly fucked. Great. Hey, uh, support the show at Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Serious Danger AU, please. Thank you so much to people who have chipped in and joined the Serious Danger patron family this week. Len, Dan, Asher, Lucy, Greyhounds Rule, Ali, mm-hmm. Nicholas, Soren Manstead. It's Soren like with one of those O's with a little line through it, which I, I really like. Attila, Attila the taxi driver, who is uh, a longtime Triple J figure who then featured in my stand-up show. Old school ballad nice. heads will know Attila the taxi driver. Oh, okay. Tyler, Fernanda, Patrick, J.A., San Diego, Maria, Bella, and Alistair. Thank you so much for your support. For just three bucks a month, you can become a Serious Danger patron and get some sweet bonus content. Tom! Have we yes. lost patrons? I don't know what's going on. We have 455 at last count. We are what shooting did we do? to Clearly, something wrong. Can we something talk about terrible. this? We're shooting for 500 by November 26th. That's the Victorian State Election and my birthday. If you have thought about it and you want to do it, if you can spare three bucks a month, we'd really appreciate you signing up. You get sweet uh, bonus content uh, all the time, which is fun for your ears. We released a free bonus, Meet the Candidates app with Victorian Greens candidate for the seat of Richmond, Gabrielle De Vitri, this week on Friday. Check that out, please. Really great conversation about her politics, about Richmond, a seat that the, the Greens really could pick up uh, on November 26th. Uh, have a listen to that. We can do all that because we are able to give our wonderful producer, The Griff, some money to sort Yay. that stuff out. So please But not do if that. you keep fucking leaving. Sorry, I'm a little bit bit. That, that's all right. I, <laughs> if you can't pay, that's fine. No, also just listening to the show. Is, is helpful. But if you can, please be a patron. Do you see we have some mail? Quick before we get into the show, one mailbag from Damien Irving who said, Hi, Emerald, Tom, and Mike. Thanks for the shout out for the Tasmanian local government elections, which we mentioned uh, a few weeks ago. You guys would have remembered Mr. Backflip. So get this from Damien. <laughs> Results are in, and we got 11 councillors elected around the state, up from eight at the last election in 2018, including. Mr. Backflip himself, Gideon yes. Cordova. Congratulations, Gideon. Congratulations, Backflip. Our acrobatic king. <laughs> Please don't <laughs> reverse any positions while you're in government um, no, and, make, and hold true to your promise that the only backflip you do is an actual literal backflip. We'd appreciate that. But congratulations <laughs> to all those Tasmanian councillors, all the candidates who run, and all the volunteers that make that kind of stuff happen. And obviously, to us, our shout out. To that is what obviously you want it. Yeah, you're welcome. You got to know when to hold up, know when to fall down, know when to walk away, know when to run. You know. Uh, Tom, 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 Tom. Did you see this week the gambling thing? Wait, actually, Tom, did you watch the Melbourne Cup? I did not. It is a barbaric, anarchic, ridiculous, anarchic, archaic. Um, anarchic. It's not anarchic. Well, you know, <laughs> it's anarchic when they, sh- when they fucking shoot the, the horses in the fucking head. Yeah. But uh, no, I truly do despise it. And I say, nup to the cup. 
Nut to the cup. Yeah, me too. I mean, so there was an interestingly timed announcement this week from the federal government that we want to talk about and talk about gambling stuff in general. They, I think on, yeah, Tuesday night, and there was some coverage on, on Wednesday, the federal government announced new rules to be added to the National Consumer Protection Framework for online gambling companies. From April next year, they'll need to include these new taglines uh, include and information on how to seek help through the gambling helpline in all of their ads instead of what you would be familiar with, the current... Gamble responsibly. Gamble responsibly. Yeah. I mean, I, do, have you used online betting? Are you a, are you a gambling man, Tom? I'm really not. I just, I, I don't, I'm way less judgy about it than I probably used to be. I hate the gambling industry and I hate, I'm disappointed when my fellow comedians do fucking sports bed ads. I think that's mm. a real, real shame. But um, no, I just, it doesn't really excite me for having a flutter. What about uh, betting on the election? No, I guess I'm interested in what the odds are. Sometimes it's mm. interesting that the uh, betting agencies are running those. But um, often they're wildly wrong, of course, like like all polls, because they're just a bunch of yeah. sporting uh, people. So who cares? But no, I've never actually placed a bet myself. Yeah, I definitely get tempted. I mean, I would say a few folks who betted on our candidates in Queensland made some tidy sums. But I've done pretty well. I do not condone using these online betting apps because they're evil. And as these rotating taglines say so when i say rotating taglines basically the way it will work they got they're gonna like switch up the taglines instead of just saying gamble responsibly over and over to avoid message fatigue which is fair enough because you hear gamble responsibly over and over and you're just like oh that's just the tagline at the end of the ad before i go ahead and place a bet anyway so yep. they have new taglines which are evidence-based um and more consistent with harm reduction ideology or you know harm reduction practice and, and evidence around gambling they include Chances are you're about to lose. Imagine what you could be buying instead. That's that's a, that's a bleak one, right? It's like that's <laughs> food on the table for your kids. Um, you win some, you lose more. What's gambling Ooh. really costing you? Ooh, again, sad, but good, I guess. And think, is this a bet you really want to place? That one I'm not so sure because, like, I don't know, wouldn't you be like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yes. Next. <laughs> Yeah, I but the, have an addiction what's gambling, problem. <laughs> I mean, what's gambling really costing you? It's like, surely that's that's yeah. It's like, oh, my relationships. If you if you do have a you know if you are doing some problem gambling, if you have gambling addiction, if it's really impacting your life, and the other thing I think is very interesting. So they're going to rotate them. They've changed up the taglines, and they even specifically talk about how they need to present it in the ads. So they need to take up the majority of the screen for video and digital ads. They also suggest using Arial font and text to be in bold. <laughs> and they say that the words for TV and radio must be read slowly, calmly, and with an even pace. So really? you can't even rush. You can't even do the rushed, like, disclaimer at the end of the ad thing. You have to actually say it. I think this is quite good. I mean, what do you think about this, Tom? Well, it's certainly an improvement, and I'll, I don't know, take it on face value that experts – have researched these and this is evidence-based and these would be better. You can certainly see how all those taglines have more of a punch and would cut through more than just gamble responsibly. Of course, responsible being one of the most overused terms in political debate in, in society. <laughs> so I don't know. if there, To the extent at which a tagline can make a serious difference, I guess you would say that this formulation of wordings and this level of regulation is an improvement on what we have. Um, but mm. I'm interested to hear from you, who, who's sort of read more into this, about really how significant this kind of stuff is or what, what these kind of moves fail to do. Because it, it also yeah. does sort of read like, you know, hey, we're doing something, Yeah. Um, whereas they might not be getting at the root of the problem. Yeah. I do think that it's it's positive. I think that, yeah, acknowledging that gambling – like gamble responsibly – the way that it's rolled out by betting companies mm. at the moment in their ads is absolutely shit as, you know, like it's a tiny little tagline. It is sped up. It's just a thing that everyone's sick of hearing. It doesn't mean anything anymore. But when I say it doesn't mean anything, it does also mean like there is a heavy meaning behind that phrase that's like take responsibility for your actions when right. gambling because it's on you how you gamble mm. and, and whether you, yeah, whether gambling is impacting your life is your individual personal responsibility. It's like shifting the blame from mm. these predatory gambling corporations that obviously everything they do is designed to wring you absolutely dry 
and make a profit from you and from ideally getting you addicted so you keep betting. Yeah, because it, it's just come at the end of an ad or, yeah. or, a, or a spruik from a, some sports bet expert who's just been encouraging you to gamble and telling you all the stats yeah. and how much money you could win and selling you on the promise of yeah. winning big on this particular sporting event. So, you know, that's the vast majority of the ad. And then to say two words at the end really quickly, uh, well, of course, doesn't necessarily counteract that. It's also like, don't reconsider making this bet. Just make sure that it's the right one. Gamble right one, yes. responsibly. responsibly. Like it's telling you, yes, gamble and be responsible about it. Don't <laughs> yeah. be, don't be an idiot. Don't get addicted. Like, and that's the thing. Yeah, it. It. I like as someone who has a close family member who dealt with pokies addiction for many mm. years, like had a really, really significant impact on their life. I think a lot of people have seen something like that and know someone who has been fucked over by pokies in particular. But gambling yeah. addiction, yeah, like any addiction, it's not about the. It's not an individual fault. It's not a moral failing. Like gamble responsibly, kind of indicates that it is. It's someone being fucking preyed on by a predatory industry and then shamed out of accessing the support that they need. And so that's what gambling harm reduction advocates have said. That's why they say we need to shift away from gamble responsibly uh, because perpetuating that like idea that this is a moral failing perpetuates that shame and that stigma that drives people away from seeking help. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, and it's still even, even though the, this change is being made, it's so clear that, that that shift hasn't really occurred yet and hopefully this makes a difference. But just recently, you know, in Queensland Parliament there was this debate around a, a casino control bill that made some changes to gambling regulations and every single fucking major party politician got up there and was like, oh, well, I don't use poker. I don't, I'm not a gambler myself. I'm not, but I think that this is, you know, this is important and we should do this. And it's like why do you feel the need to get up and and tell everyone how good you are and how you would never you know you would never gamble it wouldn't be a problem for you it just really pissed mm. me off like mm. they just have to make clear that yeah they they're better than that <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that individualization of everything, of course, and everything is a choice, and people can either choose to do bad things or choose to do good things. We've discussed this on the podcast before, but that's yeah. the way. Yeah, a lot of these social problems are, are framed, um, yeah. and yeah, it's all on you, you dirty little loser, if uh, if you're addicted to anything. Yeah, what do you think about the fact that they did announce this? I think it was the day of Melbourne Cup. Do you think that was deliberate? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, well, there's been building campaigns around around um, gambling addiction and how bad it is and, you know, pressure on various Labor governments, particularly at the state of federal level, to to do something about it. Of course, people point out the very close relationship between the Labor Party and, and the gambling industry. I mean, I think all the casino, the Crown stuff, even though the Crown stuff hasn't gone fucking anywhere and Crown has yeah. been found to not be, you know, fit to hold a casino licence mm-hmm. and then is allowed to carry on anyway, mm-hmm. all those kind of you know, stories, the the Packer stuff, it's all been building momentum to the point where people are saying this is fucking gross and we have to do something. We have to do clearly what we're doing right now isn't working and so something needs to happen. And, yeah, dropping it on Melbourne Cup Day is probably politically pretty smart. Yeah, and and in the context of, like, polling showing that there is falling support for the Cup it, itself, like there mm. was that Guardian, the Guardian released polling that found that only 15% of respondents said they had high interest in the cup, 24% said they had low interest, 28% said they had absolutely no interest at all in it. And particularly for younger age cohorts, they like don't support it, don't say that, you know, they're less likely to say it's part of our national identity. And growing numbers of people say that they believe that it normalizes animal cruelty. So that was 34%. Mm-hmm. And 45% said that it promotes unhealthy gambling behavior. So yeah, I Yay. think like is quite deliberate and you know obviously uh, as a non-official greens party podcast we should point out that yeah the greens support the nups cup we want to end public funding for horse racing and whipping and jumps racing because this is a fucking cruel industry as you say over ten thousand racehorses killed each year in abattoirs because they didn't earn enough mm. i think it's was it seven horses over the last eight melbourne cups that have died yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's fucked. But that's one thing. But also, we hate working class people, and we look down on them, and that's we think it. that obviously that's all why. working class people love um, shooting horses in the face. It's important to them and their mm. culture, and we think that's bad, and we want to ruin everyone's party. Mm. Yeah, that's not a yeah, and yeah, because it's it's anti working class to care about harms to people who like 
for whom gambling is a problem. Right. Like, <laughs> which is such bullshit. And we know, yeah, like this, the the online gambling industry is growing rapidly. And I would say that regulation has failed to keep up with that. And this is kind of just, as always, fucking lagging behind. There was this mm. ACMA survey finding in, in 2022 found that 11% of Australians reported participating in online gambling at some stage in the previous six months. It's a massive proportion of the Australian public. And what's interesting is, yeah, we know pokies are fucked, uh, but a Central Queensland University report showed that the rates of problem gambling among people who use online betting is like much higher even than pokies, so around 3.9% compared to 1.4% for pokies. Mm. So it, it genuinely is a problem. In general, actually, I, I have been thinking about this. The, the Alliance for Gambling Reform had this quote in an article I, I read recently where, and I think maybe I saw someone tweet it as well, that it's like gambling is to Australia as guns are to America. Like it is our <laughs> blind spot. It's the thing right. where every other country is like, whoa, you guys have pokies just like in your community, in neighbourhoods, like mm. in the pub where you're going for an evening meal, in a fucking shopping centre, next to a yeah. school. Like that's kind of fucked up. Like most countries don't have that. In your RSLs? <laughs> yeah. In RSLs, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like that's not normal and it's not <laughs> normal to have $25 billion in losses, gambling losses, that's from mm. 2018 to 19, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. It's the highest of any country. We have the highest gambling losses of any country. The losses on pokies are massive. We get these reported in, in Queensland are the figures that I know. But like from 2021 to 2022, $4.2 billion in gambling losses include, yeah, $2.8 billion from pokies at pubs and clubs. And that doesn't even include casinos. So it's just we are like pouring, bleeding money yeah. into this gambling industry. Uh, that is fucking evil and dodgy, as as you say. Like the the Crown and Casino, the Crown Casino and the Star Casino inquiries. We've had Star in Queensland, so yep. it's like, I guess yeah. So Crown, what they had inquiries in New South Wales, Victoria, and WA, and then Star, which is their competitor in New South Wales and Queensland. Mm. Is it true? Like. I think in almost every instance or in every instance, these corporations have been found unsuitable to hold a casino license in those states yep. and then just allowed to keep operating. Like they appoint these special going. managers and yeah. they're like, okay, we're going to have someone watch you while you continue <laughs> to be a dodgy fuck. Um, star in Queensland found to have concealed $55 million in gambling funds <laughs> through their, their Queensland venues that are pumped through by, yeah, like high rollers with triad connections. They deliberately <laughs> misled the regulator. They were found to have exploited patrons for profit. Like all of this, they're like, but guys, don't do it again, please. Don't Meanwhile. Whatever you do, don't have a brief relationship with a bikey. That's the most no, corrupt and well, worst yeah, thing that you can possibly do. <laughs> Yeah. Meanwhile, as you like, if if you sit in the government buildings or yes. like in Queensland Parliament in Brisbane, you literally hear the clanging of Queens Wharf Casino, this <laughs> mega casino with twenty five hundred new pokies approved being constructed, taking up ten percent of the fucking Brisbane CBD, handed over on this like secret long term contract that's totally commercial and confidence by mm. the government. <laughs> and it's like this is fine. This is fine. This yeah. is good and normal. I like it. It's all good. Um, yeah, I mean, what should we be doing? We know that, like, that, that's, yeah, the, this, this, these steps around advertising, sure, they're a good thing, but quite a few people quick to point out they do not, they fall far short of what we should be doing to actually reduce gambling harm. We could be, you know, further restricting advertising. We could be setting bets. Bet limits, setting limits on jackpots, on on pokies. We could be actually restricting the number of pokies that we have in the country, getting them out mm. of pubs and clubs. There was a buyback scheme in the ACT to facilitate this, as I understand it. And I think WA have like what they call the gold standard. Like they don't have them in pubs and clubs. They only kind of have them in casinos. Have you heard as well about these initiatives? I only heard about these recently, but things like reclaim the game in New South Wales and the love the game, not the odds thing in Victoria where they, they're they like government initiatives and they sponsor teams to like to to refuse gambling sponsorships to kind of block that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. I mean, again, you know, surprise, surprise, it comes down to, to matters of money, both in terms of the amount of revenue that the industry, you know, puts into state 
coffers through taxation, but also for yeah, local sports clubs, kind of the only way they can survive often is by accepting these these shitty deals and having yeah. these misery machines installed in their local <laughs> clubs just to help them, you know, keep their, their sport going. So, yeah. you know, another, a, a clear answer to that is to, to better fund community sport and allow well, <laughs> community yeah. groups to be able to survive, you know, yeah. Yeah. And there was, um, there was polling out this week, I don't know if you saw this, Tom, about support for banning certain categories of, you know, certain industries from sponsoring sports companies, obviously, in the wake of the whole Reinhardt Dolphins Thing. Yeah. Di- dolphins, diamonds. <laughs> there was so what what's interesting to me is that yeah, like of all of the categories that they put forward, this came out, was published in the Fairfax papers, this polling. 62% supported banning sponsorship from gambling, from the gambling industry, which is way right. ahead of anything else. Like 27% supported banning it from fossil fuels. Hmm. I don't really know. Yeah, I, I think that is really interesting that, that it, there's such a gap. Like, uh, why do you think? That is that people are so ready to support getting. Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's not encouraging. I mean, gambling is terrible, but it's not as bad as cooking the entire planet, I would argue. I think if, if I didn't make a choice, yeah, I'd have a living planet with focus, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. But probably there's, you know, I mean, again, in WA and Woodside, Woodside owns the state of WA and probably at every cultural and sport organization has the Woodside uh, brand uh, slapped mm-hmm. on it. So maybe people are, are attuned to the fact of how much of a huge difference that would make and yeah, like how true. much sponsorship and how powerful the fossil fuel industry is compared to, and I honestly, I know there's lots of sports bet that appears in sporting matches, but I can't uh, think of too many teams with like sports bet blazed on their jersey or whatever. Interesting. But obviously that does happen. Yeah. The other thing that we could do, of course, is tax them more. Mm. I know, yeah, during the pandemic, one thing that really pissed me off, I don't know how many states did this, but certainly the Queensland government did, gave the gambling industry a nice little tax break. They basically said, you guys don't have to pay taxes for a while. You can defer your taxes because it's been really hard for you because people have been staying home, not getting out to feed money into the pokies and also (laughs) have had a bit less money and so they haven't just been throwing it away as much potentially. Uh, And so we'll allow you to defer your- Man, Crown Casino in Melbourne was exempt from like lockdown restrictions and stuff. They were a special zone. (laughs) They get special deals. And and. Yes, as you alluded to, like, I wonder why they get all these special deals. It's just so strange. Could it have anything to do with the $81 million that has been donated to political parties by the gambling industry since 1999? No, I think that's irrelevant and you shouldn't bring it up. I'm sorry. Yeah, and and it's also obviously the, like, what are they called, the rivers of gold, revenue stream. When we talk about political donations from the gambling industry. I don't know if this is a thing that that happens outside of Queensland or if this is a purely Queensland thing, but anytime we talk about this in, in Queensland from the Greens' perspective, the Labor Party loves to yell back at us that we take gambling donations. So I feel like maybe just for anyone who is listening and has heard that argument and wondered yes. if that is true, it is not. We do not take money from gambling corporations. There's. Do, do you know where this comes from, Tom? Uh, from one guy who got rich through gambling stuff who made a donation yeah. to the Greens? Gambling stuff, by which you mean they are a poker player. Right. Uh, so literally taking money from the casino. They're yes. like, I don't know, they count cards, I think is basically I, like one of those people who know how to fucking predict what the the thing is going to be. I don't know, I think poker is kind of cool, honestly, it's, and it's far <laughs> less. Well, but it's like it has far less fucking impact. It was James Bond, okay? James Bond gave us money to the grades. He's very Yeah, cool. it's James Bond, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like just goes to show how fucking stupid, like how far away from understanding how predatory and like how the gambling industry works and like mm. the difference between a gambling corporation and someone who gambles, like, these people, fucking major party politicians, don't even understand that. I like to pretend that they don't and pretend that the Greens take gambling uh, industry donations, which we don't. Lies and cads. Always vote Greens responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure you want to vote Greens? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, we should add that to Labor ads. Are you sure you want to vote Labor? You what do you think of what you could be voting for instead? You're about to lose. Are, imagine what you could be voting for. <laughs> You win some elections, you lose more. <laughs> What's really labor really costing you? <laughs> <sighs>
Oh, yeah, and there's one other thing I'll say tomorrow because I say it every day of my life. God bless America. Land that I love, stand beside her and guide her. All right, America is going to the polls on Tuesday. It's the midterms, baby. It seems pretty fucked over there. Now, you the impression I get is you're not quite as obsessed with US politics as, as I am. No. Is that fair to say? No. My brain. I have a woman brain. It's small. Uh, I can't keep many things in there at once. So I have a lot of Queensland politics things in there and that's that's all the room I got, I'm afraid. God bless. Well, we want to find out exactly what was going on there. So we caught up with uh, my dear friend, co-host of the Dollop podcast, Dave Anthony, very funny comedian. If you haven't heard the Dollop, check it out. Incredible show that goes through amazing moments in history and uh, talks about how fucked up they are and how the past is a wild, wild country. Uh, Dave is um, it's very funny as well. Dave is um, pretty bleak as a dude and uh, you're not probably going to get a lot of hope out of here, but we do laugh a lot. So that's that's the main thing. We wanted to find out just how much the Democrats are going to lose by, whether the U.S. Green Party is any good. I don't know much about the U.S. Greens uh, at all whatsoever. Mm, Um, Again, some bad news coming down the pipeline there on that front. But here it is. This is my chat with Mr. Dave Anthony. All right, before we jump into the politics, I have to ask you, you're a blue check, I'm a blue check. Yeah. Elon Musk is is talking about introducing an $8 fee for having a blue check a month, which to me is like a tax on excellence. (laughs) Are you going to pay it? What are your thoughts? <laughs> I'm not going to pay it. I. The only reason I got a blue check was because other people were creating profiles of me and then saying stuff. Right. Um, but I, I, I don't want to pay for that. I would just probably leave the platform. Like it's just baffling to me. Like you have because I, I go to it for. I read scientists and I read news mostly, and so I want to know that they're the real, real person. But if you're going to take that away. And then the reason I'm going there, you're going to make those people pay. I, the whole thing is just like, I don't matter. I can, I can bail. And I think it, it's not a big deal, but I think there's a lot of really high profile, interesting people on there that actually provide journalism mm. and things that we need and making them pay to me is really bad. And I think he, I think he's just going to destroy the platform in about six months. I think it won't take that long for it to be just obliterated. So what does that mean? What is a post Twitter America slash post Twitter's world of comedy and politics is that is that going to be a better place for us all to live in? No, I mean I, <laughs> I, don't, think, I don't think anything gets better here. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't know. I assume there's other people trying to do social media platforms that will step up and and have something going or it could just be totally divided and uh, like the left goes off to their one and the right goes off to their one and everyone has their own little platform but Mm. it can't be worse right i mean america can't like you know twitter is just a cesspool that we can't stop going to but it's a terrible thing Mm. but we just keep going back to it so I don't know. I, I, I like I've left Twitter for a year before and I it was fine. Like you're happy and everything's fine. So I, I think a lot of people will have better <laughs> mental health <laughs> probably. Yeah. No, I sincerely think I mean, yes. In recent years, Twitter has just become the place where you go to talk about how shit Twitter is. Yeah. While also spending eight hours of your day on there. Yeah. It's um it's a wonderful combo. But uh hopefully Elon could drive it into the ground. Yeah. And we'll all get back to sensible discourse. <laughs> I mean, I hope that he, I hope he hurts it so badly that it hurts Tesla really badly and his other company gets just taken down by how bad and awful he is. Cause he's really at a precipice of being in trouble with Tesla. So, because all the other car companies now have EVs and he's not the only man on the market. And, yes, you know, he's in a dangerous place because only liberals buy his car and all he's doing is attacking liberals. So, good luck. It's really dumb. <laughs> Oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The right wing wing of the Joe Rogan fan base are probably not into EVs. That's a good point. Not at all. But and and my understanding is like Tesla Slock was inflated or at least the illusion of his genius and the idea of like played a huge role in actually bumping up how much Tesla was seriously worth. And when yeah. you keep producing cars that um explode and kill people, <laughs> that really does tend to dr- to drive your price down. <laughs> Yeah, it's not good when you have cars that explode or the doors just open up on the highway or you just can't get into it. You go out to your car and you're like, oh, I can't get in today. No, you can't. Not today. Sorry. It's really. Yeah, it's it's not a great car. Uh, it's They're fun to drive, but then, you know, they're not they're not great. So 
Good. I hope it fails. <laughs> Let's accelerate this uh, this end of everything. Yeah, um, I'm here with Dave Anthony, everybody. You know him from The Dollop. He's the best, and he's so excited. He's got election fever. On Tuesday, November the 8th, the US <laughs> goes to the polls in the midterms. <laughs> Dave can't believe he's lucky. Can't wait to see democracy in action. Oh, God. Um, y'all are voting on the 118th US Congress. So all the seats in the House are up for election. About a third of the Senate is going to the polls. Uh, 36 states and three territories are voting on governor, gubernatorial races, which if nothing else is mm-hmm. uh, is fun to say. The Democrats hold the House by 10 seats, although all that could, yes, obviously all that could go crazy. There's been the redistribution since the US census as well, so the actual like distrib- distributing of districts it will be mixed up this time around. Democrats hold the Senate by one seat with the uh, Vice President, Kamala Harris, having deciding vote in any kind of tie. Mm-hmm. It's very exciting. Democrats widely tip to lose this thing. They currently hold both the yeah the House and the Senate, and that's going to go down the drain. How would you sum up the general vibes in your country as these midterms loom, Dave Anthony? It's such a weird. Everybody's just in such a different places with it. They they've done stories and the and the what the Republicans are talking about and what the. Democrats are mostly just like abortion, abortion, you know, abortion, which is very important. Right. But the the Republicans are, uh, you know, schools and inflation and gas prices and all the stuff that's day to day. So it's a very weird sort of election in that I don't think the two sides are on the same sort of wavelength at all. Like they're not talking about the same issues or pushing the same issues. Mm. And the Democrats are, I mean, I just can't believe how bad they are at this. They, they, they don't know how to defend themselves. They don't know how to uh, go on the offense and put Republicans on defense. So they're just constantly saying, hey, it's not that bad. The economy's good. And everyone's like, well, it's not because I'm not having a good time. <laughs> like it's, you can't pay that much for gas and think it's like we, our entire country is is about getting in your car and driving wherever you're going. There's no walking anywhere. So yes. if the gas prices are high, whoever's in office is screwed. And then, you know, there's a lot to be said about oil companies gouging prices to hurt Democrats. It's a great, look, the system's great. I think it's <laughs> the best system <laughs> that can be. Well, greatest greatest country in the world and you've spread that that's system right. all around the world too which has been really nice of you as well it's it's been great uh, you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> shout out to all our iraqi listeners um but the the inflation reduction act that uh, joe biden went about my, now my understanding to chart it briefly uh, biden was absolutely cratering he had like lower opinion uh, of polls than fucking trump for example he was less popular than trump was at one point then he sort of comes through, or the Democrats somewhat get their shit together. The abortion issue plays in. Of course, the Supreme Court uh, mm-hmm. winds back pe- uh, women's and, and people with women's reproductive rights, and people say, God, you you truly are evil demons and you suck, and Democrats get a bit of out of that. The Inflation Reduction Act he passes, which is, is good, question mark, or has some good stuff in it, and the college debt relief stuff sort of – so he had this little bit of a run there that sort of worked out quite well for the Biden administration and maybe put the Democrats Democrats in a decent light. Is that a fair summary? And has all that since withered away? Yeah. And then also he came out and said he's going to try to legalize pot. Right. But, you know, the the Inflation Reduction Act was very much like that we're going to do stuff in the future. Like they were like, we're going to reduce the pr- this is the best. We're going to re- reduce the price of like 17 drugs to, you know, very very minimal prices, but it doesn't happen for four years. So it's like, wow, that's amazing. Great. Like they called it that, but I don't know what it was and I don't know what happened. And it was very complicated. It was obviously sabotaged by uh, two idiot senators. So uh, I think people, if you ask them what was in it, never would be like, I, I guess we can purchase EV vehicles in two years for cheaper. It's all, the whole thing is just very convoluted. It was like plat passes a climate bill, but all the climate people are like, well, this is actually terrible because you're, they're going to get more gasoline or oil leases. So every part of it that you should be happy about, there's another part of it. that's like, Oh, the, you're playing both <laughs> sides. So it's a mess. I think the thing that really affected his, um, his polling was the, the debt relief, which was kind of garbage. It's it's $10,000, 
which does help quite a mm. few people, but help doesn't help a lot of people. And so people were very excited about it because it was going to help people. And it looked like, I think the thing is, is it looked like they were actually finally doing something to help people, which is what they never do. Mm. And then when it came out, it's been like they've just whittled it away to who can do it and who can't. And now it's like almost helping, you know, nobody. So it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of just like they're like they're always slapping you in the face. They're like, hey, we got you a thing. You're like, oh, cool. Then they just slap you in the face. Like, what just happened? I thought we were getting a thing. No, you're getting slapped in the face instead. Sorry. And the pot thing was the same thing. He comes out and announces that he's going to pardon all these you know, people who have been arrested for pot crimes and it turns out it's only six thousand six thousand people none of whom are in currently in jail they're all out of jail and, oh, and it's just, God. so everything every time they say they're going to do something and then you read it you're like that's not a thing like you're not doing anything so his his polls are taking and then the other thing is you know they did during covid they did all these things like child tax credit which which gave a lot of people money who had kids Mm. And and unemployment um, was uh, you get a higher amount for unemployment and all this stuff. And then that all went away this year. So he, as he tanked, it was because all of those social programs that were temporary were going away. Mm. So people who were living pretty decently more than they ever had. I mean, we reduced poverty massively, but it wasn't a permanent solution. So we reduced poverty and then went, now nah, you're now you're back in poverty anyway, vote for me. And that kind of stuff. You just like, it's bewildering. <laughs> like, I don't know what, what is that? How, how is that politics? <laughs> I love the new normal that we all get to enjoy. Yeah. It's fucking great. The new normal with more poverty. <laughs> fucking hell. Yeah. So there's two idiot senators you mentioned. Again, if, if people like who are, are somewhat obsessed with all this stuff like me will, will know this, these are two, I mean, they're right wing. They're right wing Democratic uh, yeah. senators. They're, they're often presented as, as moderates or something, but they're absolutely not. They're basically right wing. This is this is Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema, who have sort of adopted the mantle. Kristen Cinema used to be cool and like used to be actually quite left wing uh, yeah. and radical, and then sold sold her soul along yeah. the way. And her, her and Joe Manchin basically uh, their job because the majority of the Democrats have in the Senate is so small. They have extraordinary amount of power to basically reduce the vision um, and um, scale down anything that the yeah. slightly more progressive Democratic majority might want to do, and they use that power. Now, I've also heard the theory that they are just the two identified people who are who are doing that. That is, if they did not exist, if they were replaced by more progressive members, you'd yeah. find two other members that would very easily wield exactly the same power. Do you think that's that's kind of fair? That's the theory that has played out repeatedly throughout my life. <laughs> uh, over and over and over again, whenever there's a large issue or a large bill that can help a lot of people, there's always a Democrat that stands in the way. Right. Under Obama, it was Lieberman. He was the he was the big bad guy who stepped up and all of a sudden wouldn't um, allow Medicare for all. So it had to be changed to Obamacare, which is a right wing um, health care plan. So mm -hmm. there's a, yeah, there's always a Democrat. There's always one or two that step up and take the heat and then everyone gets mad, but it's just like, but it's the road. It's a rotating villain is what it's called. The rotating villain theory. Right. I completely subscribe to it at this point because it happens every single time. And at some point you just have to go like, mm. it's not working, whatever. I don't know why, because why would you vote for them if this is what's always going to happen. And that's a problem. Like it's nothing gets done. Mm. Kristen Cinema is a, is a weird one because she's not really right wing. Right. I would say she's more uh, the party of hedge funds. <laughs> she's this freestanding floating party of hedge funds and they, she does whatever they want. And, uh, and it's idiotic, but I guarantee you she'll get out of office soon. She'll be voted out soon. And then she'll just be on the boards of hedge funds and, or whatever they have to, you know, live comfortably for the rest of her life. Cause she made them billions and billions of dollars. She'll get a payoff. Mm. Manchin's just a coal guy. Like he loves coal. He sleeps with it. He kisses it. It's his thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but are they, so you think she's, or are they even up for election? I, I don't even know if Manchin or, or Sinora are, are on the ballot no, this, neither, this time around. Cause it's only like 35 senators. That's the other thing. The rotating villain is never up for uh, up in the next election. The rotating villain is always, <laughs> you know, four or six years down the line. Right. Okay. That's that's part of being the rotating villain. So, yeah, they're, I think they're two years from now, they'll both be up. She'll lose. I don't know okay. if he'll lose. Yeah. Yeah. 
How crazy is our system to watch from afar? It's well, I mean, it's terrible. It's insane. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, you need to be pretty bad for someone in Australia to think. I'm glad we don't have that um, <laughs> because we also have. <laughs> Yeah, you guys aren't great either. <laughs> no, we suck too. We got a fucking queen, bro. Or a king now. Yeah. We got a king. Uh, you got a king. I, didn't, <laughs> I forgot to congratulate you. Congratulate you on that. I'm supposed to, every Australian I meet, I'm supposed to say congratulations on your new, your new king. <laughs> That's the only, like, we're insane, but at least we don't have a king or queen. It's the, it's mind boggling that if this year, you guys have hobbits also? Like, what else do you have? <laughs> I challenge you to a duel if you insult my lead. <laughs> Fucking kill me. All right, let's um whip through some of these. And if you haven't been paying uh, attention, I'm sure like these are the races that have jumped out at me in terms of like have made the headlines that are particularly spicy and insane. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts here. So we've got the Arizona Senate. you got Mark Kelly, former astronaut, up against Blake mm-hmm. Masters. Now, Blake Masters oh. is a 36-year-old venture capitalist and associate of mega donor Peter Thiel yeah. who injects himself with the blood of younger men. That's Peter Thiel, not, not Blake Masters. Right. And I don't care if he sues me for libel or whatever. That's the fucking truth, man. That's what Teal fucking does. That's sicker. Um, he does. <laughs> he definitely does that. Yeah. So Blake Masters and JD Vance as well, who was the writer of Hill, uh, like Hillbill Elegy. They, these are sort of the the scions of Peter Teal. He's funded their campaigns mm-hmm. uh, substantially, and they are vaguely in the realm of or would paint themselves as something like a right wing populist. That are they sort of at the forefront of that kind of new emergence of the Republican Party that. J.D. Vance certainly said, oh, Trump sucks initially. He came out and, like, everyone was trying to understand yeah. people in the in the middle of the country who were plagued by the opioid crisis, and now he's since backflipped on that and said, no, Trump's really, really good. Please vote for me and, and send me to Washington. <laughs> um, what are we to make of the Blake Masters, Mark Kelly, fucking J.D. Vance bullshit? I mean, they're, they're kind of – they're just like a – different version of what Republicans have always been, which is just rich monsters. <laughs> and they just found new funding and they found a new avenue. They found a guy who, you know, like we said, injects the blood of young people into his body. And and a guy who's essentially, mm-hmm. you know, a fa- he's just a pure fascist deal. Don't sue me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very disturbing. And the fact that it works is mind boggling. They're so transparently just full of garbage, everything they present, but their ideas are terrifying. I mean, their ideas are just straight up pure fascism. And they're, I think they're both like neck and neck as last time I looked, both of those races were like 50, 50. Mm. And if it's 50, 50, they're gonna, they're gonna, the Republicans will win because they'll stop enough um, people who are not white from voting to swing that election. (laughs) They're right wing populists, and right wing populists are always just full of garbage. So you know that's what why I say it's the same old thing. It's just it's just this brand that's kind of always been there. Well, it's it's just impossible to determine, right? Because of course, a right wing populist, uh, and I've heard you know, this new version of the new right or this Trump inspired young generation of the right who who hate neoliberal capitalism or at least recognize the economic system that we have is fucking over the American family. But yeah. their medicine for that problem is not to, yeah, make unions stronger or to try and, right. you know, sometimes they make noises about breaking up big tech, which is like, is Peter Thiel going to back that idea in? But, uh, yeah, once you get down to it, you go, well, no, you just sort of sound like a – you just sound like a normal uh, Republican who just really, really mm-hmm. hates wokeness and thinks wokeness is the worst thing in the world and just wants to – you know, play out on all those cultural issues. That seems to be the main, yeah. what it all comes to in the end. Yeah. And and, and it, it, it's always cultural issues. It's so funny. I'm doing a, I'm, I just wrote a doll last night. That's about um, this woman who just did the same thing in the sixties and seventies. It's all, it just never stops They're, they're They've always been opposed to wokeness because they just want white people to rule everything and they don't want anybody else to have a voice and have to even listen to it. So I can't handle when people get into the woke thing, my brain just starts to fry out because I can't, it's just so dumb <laughs> and it's just so, it's, it's so stupid. Yeah. I, I can't take it, but that's, that's what's driving a lot of them to the polls. The, the, the right is just like, mm. I don't know what they're going to vote to get people to stop saying stuff. Like, I, I don't know what they think is about to happen, but yeah, it's the whole woke thing. <laughs> I heard Peter Thiel bail. I heard Peter Thiel left America and would just threw up his arms at all this stuff. Like, like six months ago, he he funded all these guys and then just like was like, ah, I can't take it. And he left. So I don't know what's going on. 
Oh, sorry, Peter Thiel. Triggered much by America? You little snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that guy. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so the races real quick. We've got, of course, Her- Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock. Oh. Uh, this is for the Georgia Senate race, this incredible primary uh, <laughs> primary race that everybody watched and is now obviously in the general. Uh, Herschel Walker, a uh, former footballer, definitely got a whole lot of CTE going on, yeah. uh, presented himself as a you know a traditional uh, family values Republican, then turns out to have had lots of – he's made a lot of love to a lot of ladies across the place yeah. and uh, fiercely recommended that they get an abortion, mm-hmm. uh, which is sort of against the thing that he sort of says. And then Republican said, we don't care. As long as he goes mm-hmm. in there and votes the right way now, we have no principles whatsoever. So uh, we'll vote for this guy. No worries at all. And this like this race, and he's against uh, Raphael Warnock, who is the, the sitting senator, right? And uh, it's getting very tight, like extremely tight, way mm-hmm. tighter than you would think when one of those <laughs> candidates uh, has this abortion-based scandal in <laughs> His background and is running on the Republican ticket. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, Herschel Walker is an incredible monster. He like not only demanding that that women get abortions that have his, or, and then instead of having his children, but also beating them up like he's a really terrible, terrible person. Mm. Uh, so, and then what he said, what comes out of his mouth. You can't believe it, but I've been around. I've watched Reagan and I've watched all of these guys up till up to Trump. It's all the same. Like none of this stuff has ever changed in my life. There, there, there are a lot of the times just brain dead idiots saying stuff, and you can't believe what comes out of their mouth, and yet they win elections. And right now, it's worse than ever because I think that. I think that Republicans just want to make liberals mad. So they're happy to find the right. worst. Like if they could just run a child molester, they'd be like, this is going to be great. <laughs> it's going to make them so mad. Well, they did. <laughs> That's no, they did. You're right. That, that, that guy back in 2018. Who was that fucking? They did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What was that guy's fucking name? Yeah, I forget his name. Ruff Moore? Roy, Roy, Roy Moore, wasn't it? I think it was Roy Moore, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, look, they they are going to run the worst people and they are going to get behind him because they know at the end of the day that person's going to back all the right-wing, rich nonsense that they want. And, you know, their their entire platform is sociopathic, so why not get just sociopaths? <laughs> it's... <laughs> It's really bad. I think Herschel Walker will win. And the reason I think he'll win is because they've taken like 120,000 people off of the uh, voter registration list. Um, oddly, most of them black, if you can imagine that. So, which is, you know, the same old, same old. What? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Greg Palast is a really good journalist and he has been covering it for a while and George is uh, in bad shape. Yeah. Mm. Was that the hope you were looking for? <laughs> yeah, no, this I, I remember the last time I had you on a podcast, I was like, okay, don't don't ask Dave Anthony for hope. That's not gonna work out. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Pennsylvania <laughs> That's not gonna make anyone happy. That's not what uh, that's not what we're here for. Um, the Pennsylvania Senate race. Uh, okay, this is John Fetterman versus Dr. Mehmet Oz. Dr. Oz himself from the Oprah program. Mm-hmm. Now, I had a lot of talk that John Fetterman was kind of good, or at least from left point of view, that we should be hopeful about him and that at least he was, yeah. uh, I think he was decent on workers' rights and stuff. He's six foot eight mm-hmm. tall and, you know, the tall guy always wins the election. That's the only thing I know yes. about American politics. He had a stroke during the election and is sort of still recovering from that. He did a pretty, had a pretty shitty debate performance where he looked, seemed very scattered and all over the place and was yeah. also exposed as being is sort of definitively against fracking and then saying that he is for fracking. He seems to have, that campaign seems to be falling apart a little bit. And his uh, opponent, of course, is Dr. Oz, for fuck's sake. So there's been a lot of attention on this because, of course, he's a celebrity. A guy who used to say that Trump was bad is now kind of been like, eh, maybe Trump's okay. Maybe he did win the election in uh, yeah. in 2020. Who knows? I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm not an electoral expert. Um, how do you think this, this thing's going to play out? That one is, to me, the craziest that that's the election that makes me go but maybe maybe there is a god and he hates leftists or <laughs> or maybe this is a simulation and the simulation is like we're going to do everything that can upset you and do bad things 
the fact that he had a stroke is just, you just can't believe because he's before the stroke, kind of the perfect candidate. Look, he, the fracking thing is really problematic because of Pennsylvania. They make so much money off of fracking. There's so many people have their jobs off fracking. So locally, I don't know anybody who can be against it and, and win. So I understand why he did that, but uh, doc, it came out that Dr. Oz kills puppies. He's killed like <laughs> he's killed like 400 puppies in in ways that are like, you know, egregiously scientifically horrible that people are like, no, I, we don't do that as scientists. Like he's he's just been killing puppies for years. He's a, uh, like and you're like, we have a puppy killer. Yeah, we finally this is the one thing. Everybody likes puppies and then he might win. And you're like, how does the puppy killer that debate? (laughs) So he has an, he has a, which is very common after you have a stroke, he has an auditory issue where he uh, sometimes hearing it doesn't work, but if he reads it, he's totally fine. Right. And so now you have this debate where he doesn't perform well because that is an issue. Um, It doesn't mean he couldn't do the job. He can obviously do the job. Because there's other people in the center right now who read instead of, you know, because they're all like 95 years old. So it was really sort of a tragic um, debate. But then the other side is like the other guy kills puppies. So you should want to vote for a pumpkin or or like a blanket over him. Like just like an empty chair is better than the puppy murderer. Also, the puppy murderer has been on TV for decades. Mm -hmm. Just spewing out nonsense medical garb. I mean, he is the classic snake oil salesman that we've had in this country since since like the 1800s. Right. He is the bad doctor guy. And you watch this and you're like, this guy is purely a villain from puppy killing all the way to everything else. A pure villain. And he might win. And it's like, there's literally like, that's when you're like, there's no hope. I mean, what what is you should want to check nobody instead of him. He should not be anywhere near office, regardless of who his opponent is. But people are like, I don't know. The other guy talks weird. I mean, his, <laughs> most of his opinions are all good. Like he wants to help workers and he wants to give everybody health care. And um, yeah, but he he talks weird. The, maybe the puppy killer. Because the puppy killer talks good. He does talk good. And he's been talking on TV for a long time. And surely the Trump example is the, the power of guy who's been on TV for ages. Yes. He's extremely powerful. It really comes through in American politics. And let's let's not let Oprah off the hook here. Oprah did not come out no. and say, Dr. Oz is a monster. I was wrong about him. He should not. Like, she could turn the election overnight, and she's just sitting on the sidelines. Well, again, yeah, she's like your queen, and they're not allowed to express their uh, political opinion on things. They're, they're uh, removed from the political process. <laughs> it's part of the constitutional Oprahocracy that you live under. Yeah, yeah, but your queen, your queen did a coup in your country. Like she, in the, you know, seventy, that's 70, true. Was seventy five? Like, uh, so our queen could do it. That's true. That's true. <laughs> she should get more involved. <laughs> she should dismiss Doctor Oz. <laughs> Okay, so I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this question, but if you had to call it now, if you're a betting man, uh, are we saying Republicans are taking back the House and the Senate? Yeah, and I I don't think it'll be I I don't think it'll be close. I don't I think that um, (laughs) it'll be there'll be easy victories, and I don't think we'll be hanging on that overnight thing. I think that people are going to be kind of shocked by how mad people are, Democrats. I just there's too many people that are just it's it's never that. Republicans get more voters. It's the Democrats stop voting. Right. That's what always kills us. And so that's what I think is going to happen. Wonderful. And then that will result <laughs> in a what a Congress that doesn't do anything. Of course, not the Congress is doing heaps beforehand, but in terms of the Republicans have literally said they will block Biden's agenda across the board, just as they did with Obama when they won back in twenty. Uh, what was that, 20, 2010? And so even though the Democrats weren't doing very much at all before, they will do absolutely nothing, which will yeah. make people angry than ever leading up to the 2024 presidential. Is that, the, that your future predictions? Uh, yeah, that's about right. I, 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 although I wonder with Biden, Biden is so conservative at heart that I wonder, because right. he's always worked with Republicans, like that's like his you know, magic. And, um, and so I wonder if they will get stuff done, which is like privatize Social Security and, and privatize Medicare and you know, do the things that Biden has talked about for a while doing. Mm. So they could, but you know, I think you're probably right. Is that they'll just block everything and go, nothing's getting done, and then people will be like, get rid of Biden. Like, you know, that's that's the most 
high possibility. But also the other, you have to think of like these are very fascist people, and they could um, try to impeach Biden or do you know something else. Mm. Um, that whatever they're going to do, I think it's far worse than we expect because I think they are really, really terrible people. And so you know, it's like hang on, it's going to get weird. How do you? How do you? Oh, how did you? Like abortion went away and. You fucked that up. Like you, you couldn't even write that. Like that. <laughs> it's just like your base should be fired up to go out. Are they running on a federal, a federal bill to try and allow abortion across no. the the whole country? Is that what they're actually running on, or are they just saying vote for us and things won't be as bad, uh, abortion wise, that it will be with Republicans? That's it. Oh, yeah, they're God. saying they're saying it don't don't let Republicans win because they're bad on abortion, as opposed to like they they keep saying we're gonna. He says if we get two more senators, we're going to codify Roe v. Wade, which isn't I, I don't think is possible now. But it, uh, also you had that under Obama and you didn't do it. So, like, you know, I, at some point, everyone's like, no one knows what they want to do because they don't spell anything out. They never say mm. exactly what they want to do. So nobody really knows. So when they say the abortion thing, it's just the other guys are worse than us is what and as you can tell during Trump, that worked great. Worked really well. All right, seriously, last question. And again, I'm not looking for Dave Anthony Hope. That's not how Dave Anthony works. In terms of the progressive caucus, the squad within the Democratic Party, that also seems to be going to shit a little bit, like you know, the likes of the AOC and a bunch of other reps. Uh, you know, Rashida Tlaib still seems to be fighting the good fight, but there does seem to be a buckling to, of pressure uh, for the, from the left, the kind of um, new generation of leftist Democrats explicitly identified as Democratic Socialists who were elected, you know, as part of the, the burning wave. I'd love your thoughts on that little update there. And then outside of that, you know, we are a Greens. We, we, this podcast is based around the Australian Greens. We're both Greens members, myself and Emerald. We think the Greens are the least shit Australian political party and the ones with the, the decent, the most decent and realistic attempt at, at building power in Australia. So I don't know much about the US Green Party. I, I, they don't seem to have any representatives, you know, at the federal level whatsoever. Of course, they run in the presidential elections and uh, get small slivers, slivers of the vote. Is there much to like about the US Green Party? And um, yeah, do you see much, much cause for, for them getting anywhere anytime soon? No, I, you know, they, they, they made a major mistake coming out of the gate, which was, I, I think if you're going to start a new party, you have to start really from grassroots and start getting local candidates elected, you know, city councils and mayors and things of that nature. And mm -hmm. then you build up your party that way, but they went straight to top down, which is like, let's have a presidential candidate. And, and that was just right. never gonna, never gonna work. And no one's going to vote for, uh, the Green Party versus the Republican or Democrats, because both sides are too scared, or specifically Democrats are too scared to switch and vote because they think Republicans will easily win if they do that. So I don't even know what that party is anymore. I mean, they did come up with a new Green Deal. Like that was their plan that AOC kind of adopted and took. Mm -hmm. But um, I just don't see them as a viable anything. And it only gets worse. I know it's only getting the, the possibility of electing people from third parties is getting less and less as we go on. But the Democratic Socialists have elected um, quite a few city council members, Chicago and Seattle. And, you know, we've got, I think, I think we'll have three in LA come um, January. LA's, you know, we're, yeah. we're doing a pretty good job on those monsters in our city council, mm. but that's about it. That's kind of the only headway we're making. Yeah. Uh, the Green Party's confused and not good. I don't think it compares to your, your Green Party in Australia, I think it's much sure. more bewildering and un it's just hard to nail down what it is. It's good, right? To describe a party as bewildering. <laughs> <laughs> what do we want? To be bewildered. <laughs> and what about the, uh, the the squad and such? Uh, what do you make of uh, oh. those particular leftist um, uh. ladies? Or there's one dude in there, I think, too, in the squad. Yeah, there's a there's a guy in there. Um, th I mean, there's there's a couple people. Cory Booker, I still uh, uh, Cory Booker. I don't think I Cory Bush. Um, there there's there's a couple <laughs> in there that I like still, but they're really uh, that you you watch them get sucked into the machine and the machine just yeah. starts to rejigger their thinking and and then and then now they're like it, it'll all take time and you're like right we don't have time so mm. i think i've lost a lot of 
faith in them being able to do anything. I think they've made really bad strategic choices. I think that they, they just go along with everything and they're not carving out a position that will bring people over to their side and support them. Uh. So if you don't believe in like the main sort of nonsense that goes on, I, I don't feel like there's any group of people in Congress that you can like go, Oh, that that's going to work. It's just, I really thought they might be something, but I, now I don't think really anything of it. I, I think they're just Democrats at the end of the day. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> we've got to wrap it up. <laughs> that help? You glad you called me? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I filled some time, I guess, and it gave us a little preview of uh, of the death, the death that's coming down the pipeline. But Dave Anthony, uh, thank you for being on Serious Danger and telling us about those things. People can listen to your wonderful podcast, The Dollop, with Gareth Reynolds. If you're sick of all the horror in the present, you can listen to The Dollop and find out about all the horrible things that have happened in the past, which is always really, really helpful. And we have a we have a new podcast called The Pastimes, which is a, a similar similar to the dollop, but the basic idea is, which I want to get you on it, is uh, I because I would read old newspapers doing research. Oh yeah, and so I was like, why don't I just take a day, a newspaper from like eighteen forty, and we'll just read through it with Gareth and a guest, and uh, and so that's the podcast. It's pretty fun. It's less dark. It's less um, dark and depressing as the dollop can be. It's just more kind of goofy and fun. Give people a little break, you know. I assume more horrifically racist than the novel. It's a lot. It's actually I avoid the I avoid <laughs> <laughs> specifically avoid all the. I mean, of course, there's like you know 50, 50 people killed the black guy. That happens, but uh, but uh, I try to avoid those. <laughs> I try to not read those. I read a story about how a, a lamb uh, ate a dog or whatever. It was a different time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That is called The Pastimes, and that's actually that will be out by the time people hear this on this Sunday. That will be out into the world, The Pastimes, with Dave and Gareth Reynolds. Uh, good luck, Cobraid. Uh, please move to Australia. We'd love to have you. I've, ta- I've talked to people about moving to Australia. I've, ta- I've talked to producers and said, oh. hey, can you get me a work permit for years? <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome, and everything here is perfect. <laughs> You know that guy who broke into Paul Pelosi's house? Yeah. He's got story, yes. He was a registered member of the uh, US Greens. Oh, good. 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 Want to make a difference in <laughs> our lives? <laughs> <laughs> our call to action this week is a bit of a cheeky one. So I, saw, I told Tom this was too cheeky, but he said we should just, you know, ask for help when we need it from our listeners. We're cheeky chops. We are cheeky. And what we would love for you to do is please vote for us in the Australian Podcast Awards Listener's Choice category. Um, We'll put the link in the show notes. It's australianpodcastawards.com forward slash vote. And I don't know, what can we win if we win? Just satisfaction? Glory. Glory? I don't know. It costs us money to enter this thing. We've also entered like the other categories. That costs us money. So I really hope we win something. But um, look, I have no idea of the level of credibility of these awards but it's all very nice and it would be nice to get a little bit of recognition and spread the word of uh, the serious danger gospel so yeah australianpodcastawards.com slash vote you can search, you just search for serious danger and you can vote for us if you think we are deserving if we are your listeners choice then um, yeah. we would appreciate that very much i fucking hope that we are <laughs> um yeah that would make me really happy and of course as always if you haven't left a review for the show please do do it on Apple Podcast or, or wherever you're listening. Leave us a five-star review and something cute, something funny, something cuddly. Um, if you're not already, please support the show on Patreon. Help us reach our goal of 500 patrons by Tom's birthday slash Victorian state election. And follow us on the socials. We're at Serious Danger AU on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok for all the other info. Head to SeriousDangerPod.com and podcast responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> Every podcast is doing you damage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure you want to listen? Bye, everyone. 
Bye. Serious danger, Australia.